Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for our time together today. Father, we think of all of those who are suffering today, Lord, and we think of those who are rejoicing today, Father, and we would just ask that you would bless each one in your own special way, Lord. We know that 3,000 years ago, Father God, that you anointed David to preach your word, Lord, to write your word, to share your word with us, Father. And he wrote, how excellent is your loving kindness, O oh God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. So, Father, we just give you all of our faith. We give you all of our love. We give you this time with you together, with those of us who love you, Lord. We think of those who wanted to be here this morning but couldn't make it. We thank you, Father, for those who came for breakfast today. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of serving you to live our lives each and every day, knowing that no matter what happens tomorrow, we can put our trust in you. I ask, Lord, that you would anoint my brother Aaron, Father, as you did Moses and David and Joshua and so many people in the Bible, Lord, that you blessed with your anointing, that he would exhort us, Lord, that he would edify us this morning with your word, that you would speak through him, Lord, the things that you would have us to know. Help us, Lord, to apply those things to our lives. Help us to be a blessing to those around us. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. In the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Barnabas. All right, I'm going to get rid of these things. I'll see if I can deal with the glare. How many of you guys uh, have had a moment in your life where you like thought, God, what are you doing here? You, made, you clearly made a mistake. Anybody had that moment? Um, I, I certainly have. Uh, sometimes it's things that I've kind of watched. Some, how many of you have had a moment where you're reading, reading the Bible and you go, what? Anybody had that? We're going to have one of those moments today. We're going we're gonna to get in the book of Acts, Acts uh, chapter 5, and we're going to look at Ananias and Sapphira. And I'm gonna, we'll get there in a minute, but um, we're, gonna, we're also going to spend a little time in John, John 6. And, um, but I wanted to start um, by asking you if you if, just want you to think for a moment on something that, if I say the word phony or fake, something kind of counterfeit, Something come to mind. You don't have to share it right now. Just think. Just ponder that for a minute. Um, I think about a friend of mine who has a pizzeria down south, and a few mo- couple months ago, he he got a hundred dollar bill. Uh, except it really wasn't a hundred dollar bill. If you looked at it, looked from a distance, it looked like the real deal. But when you look closely, it said for movies only. <laughs> really small print, right? So. It got treated like $100. They gave them $100 worth of pizza. That's a lot of pizza. But they didn't really have $100 at the end of it. It was fake. It wasn't the real deal. Um, when I was in high school, um, I wasn't a great athlete, but I was a good runner. And the longer, the longer we ran, the better, I, the better I did. I wasn't a sprinter. But, and my junior year of high school, I got invited to run an international team that went to Canton, China. And it was kind of cool because I was poor, and it was $1,800. That wasn't the cool part. The cool part was I lived in a community that, that, was, that was willing to donate money for me to be able to go. So I didn't have the $1,800, but I was able, the Lord provided for me to be able to go. And it was, it was the, my first time out of the country, and I grew up in a town, actually, I grew up outside of a town of 3,000 people. Pretty small, a lot smaller than Kona, right? And, and the first place we go, Hong Kong. 10 million people, I think, at the time. They're like the sights and the smells, and it's like, this is very different, right? And, uh, and then we went to China, uh, and, and we did our racing there. One of the stops that we made was in Seoul, Korea. And uh, now I was from the mainland, so I was used to cold weather, but I wasn't expecting it to be so cold. I think the high temperature was like 13 degrees. And so my very first purchase was a pair of gloves. We were only there for the day, but I needed them for the day. And then, you know, we're a bunch of runners, right? So what do you think we're going to look at? Running shoes, right? Uh, I grew up in the, in the Pacific Northwest outside of Eugene. And Eugene, if you didn't know, is called Track City. They have Hayward Field there. They have, they have uh, a lot of the times they'll have the Olympic trials there for the, for the track and field. Um, 
There are legends like Alberto Salazar and Mary Decker Slaney. And so um, I'm like surrounded by these idols, these guys that are great runners in this area where there's all running. Now, in my high school, it wasn't cool to be a runner. I wasn't, what, you know, it wasn't the cool sports like football or basketball or baseball. I, I played those for fun when nobody was watching, right? That was, that was, but I could run, right? So we're, so here I am in Seoul, Korea, and I, now my favorite, the shoes that I u was used to were Asics and Nike. Ni and Nike actually started in the Pacific Northwest. So we see these shoes. Oh, these are New Balance shoes, and they were like, I don't remember exactly, but they were like five or ten bucks for shoes. Now this is back at a time where I would generally spend like fifty or sixty dollars for a pair of shoes. So this is pretty cheap, right? And I'm like. New, Bal new New Balance shoes for five or ten bucks, I'm getting two pair. Now, later on when I got home and I looked at them, they were really a worth about five or ten dollars. They were knockoffs. They weren't the real deal. In fact, the two shoes were supposed to be the same. They didn't even look the same. But I was, I was, I was thinking that I was getting a, a good deal on real New Balance, but these were knockoffs. They weren't the real deal. Now, we're going to look at, in, um, in the book today, we're going to study about something that's not really the real deal. And um, but, so I asked you to think about something that was fake. Okay, I'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. But let's go ahead and open up our Bibles. Um, now let me, let me give you, we're going to be in Acts, but let me just tell you a little bit about where we're at. Because uh, do you guys remember who wrote the book of Acts? Luke. Luke, that's right. Luke, I love Luke. Luke wrote two volumes. His first book, The Gospel of Luke, is all about... Jesus, his, 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 uh, his life, his, the ministry, his death and resurrection. And then he does a second volume, that's Acts, and it's awesome because it, it goes through all of the early church from the time of, of Christ leaving the earth until, you know, the, it, and it, just the early church and its development and, and great characters in there. Um, and he wrote the book to Theophilus. And Theophilus is, was actually a person but the name Theophilus means lover of God. Seems pretty appropriate that you would write about the life and death of Jesus, and you would write, to anybody that loves God should read these two books. And at the start of Acts, Jesus is, it's, it, he's, he's actually revealing himself for 40 days after he, after he died and raised from the dead. He's, he's on earth for another 40 days to be a witness to everyone around him. In another place of the Bible, it shares that over, there were over 500 witnesses to his resurrection. You think that was by accident? No. He wanted to make sure that there were a lot of witnesses that he was up from the grave. Because a lot of the, a lot of the people there, the Jews especially, wanted him to be dead. They didn't really want him to still be alive. So he showed himself to be a proof. Now it's interesting that he chose 40 days before he goes into heaven because I don't know if you've noticed there are, there are thing, numbers in the Bible that have significance. And 40 is kind of an interesting one because do you remember how many, how many days during the time of the flood, how many, how many days and nights did it, did it rain? 40. 40. Okay. I'm gonna f there are others, but I'm going to focus on three people. Um, that, that, do you guys remember it when, when uh, Jesus took his uh, uh, Peter, James, and John, the inner circle, he takes them up to the Mount of Transformation, uh, Transfiguration. Do you remember when he goes up there? Who else was there? Who joins them at, this, at the scene? Do you remember? Elijah. Elijah and Moses. Well, it's interesting because Jesus, Moses, and Elijah all have the number 40 in, in their, in, involved with them. I'll, I'll explain. Um, Elijah, on his way to Mount Horeb during his ministry, is fast for 40 days. Moses... His life, is, his life is 120 years, and it's kind of broken down into, into 40 years and 40 years and 40 years. First 40 years, he's in the Pharaoh's household. He kills a soldier, remember that? And then he flees for his life, he goes to Midian, and he spends 40 years preparing to lead the people out of Israel by, what was he taking care of, you remember? Sheep. In other words, he was busy dealing with stupid animals so that he could be ready to lead stupid people through the desert. And, uh, and so, and then when he's, and, and so they spend, how many years were they in the desert? 40 years. So 40 years, he's leading these people. Now, remember he goes up to Mount Sinai, and he's on there for how many days? 40 days, not, he's fasting for that time. You'd think the Lord would feed him during that time, but he said, no, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to, I'm going to, you're going to bring down the law for me. So he comes down, 
And, he, uh, and, and what does he do the first time he comes off the, the hill? He, th he sees the people in sin, and what does he do? Throws them down. He's got these tablets in his hands. He throws them down. They break. <sighs> Not a good thing, because get, you know what has to happen? He's got to go back up the hill. How many days and nights do you think he fasts for that one? Another 40. 40. Another 40 days of fasting. Then he comes down with the, with the law. Now, it's interesting because when he comes, so the day he comes back and, and, and delivers the law, Remember, the law is a standard that brings us death because it brings, it's a standard that we can't, we can't match up to, right? So he comes down. Do you remember? So, so when they come down, when he comes down off the mountain, there, was, there were 3,000 people that died that day. God judged them. Now, it's interesting because we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit today. And when, when Je Jesus ascended um, af after 40 days, and it's interesting because I don't know if you remember this or noticed this before, but he actually ascends into heaven from the Mount of Olives, which was a spot where Jesus would spend a lot of his time. At night, many times, he, you know, he didn't have a house. Sometimes people say, oh, Jesus had a house and he was rich and he had this. He didn't have, he would just stay where he was. And, and so he, he leaves and goes up into heaven um, and the, the disciples watch him go up into heaven. And then he tells them though, he tells them to go wait in Jerusalem for what? What are they supposed to wait for? The Holy Spirit, that's right. Now, do you remember what he, Jesus said the Holy Spirit's going to come, and what did he say the, the Holy Spirit was going to do? It's going to be a helper. That would imply that, we, that they needed what? Help. This last week, uh, my wife and I celebrated 20 years of marriage together. Praise the Lord. Uh, and do you remember Adam and Eve? He makes Adam first, and then he has to make... Eve, and what was Eve's job? Helper. To be a helper. Why? Because Adam needed help. Now, if you talk to my wife, she will tell you that I need help. And so, uh, by God's grace, she's helped me for this last 20 years, and hopefully she'll help me for the next 20 as well. But, um, so, Jesus is leaving, but he's sending a helper because we need help, and the early church needed help. But while they're waiting, they've got it. So, he leaves in, at day 40, Day, day 50, day of Pentecost, is when the Holy Spirit comes. So there's actually 10 days where they're in prayer. They're gathering together and they're praying. And in the initial group, it's interesting because did, did, Peter, did Peter have a perfect ministry when Jesus, when he was walking with Jesus? Any, anybody know, remember any mistakes that he made? You know, like, I don't know, denying the Lord three times in one night, the night before he's going to die for, for the sins. So, but Peter fails at the, at the end of, uh, of Jesus' time on the earth. But here comes a new Peter, right? Peter, Peter post-resurrection of Jesus, he's powerful. And he, when they, the, the initial church is, mentions 120 people in Acts, 120 people gathered together. And there's one disciple that's missing. You remember who that was? Somebody, somebody really failed. That would be Judas. So Judas failed. So now there's an opening in the 12, right? So so Peter says, you know what? We need, we need somebody to join our team of 12 that was with Jesus from the time he was baptized until his, his death and resurrection. So we need somebody who can be a witness of all of that. So they raise up two men, and Matthias is the one who gets, they, pull, they draw lots and say, the Lord, you pick, and he picked Matthias. So Matthias joins him. And then, now the day of Pentecost comes. Now the day, this is the day the Holy Spirit comes on them. Now, they started as a group of 120, right? So they come down, and, uh, and suddenly they're speaking in tongues of fire, right? That's what, that's what, the, that's what Acts des describes, is tongues of fire that come on to them, and, and they are praising the Lord in all, in, in all kinds of languages, all from all around the world. So if you hear somebody talk in a different language, you go, oh, that's just gibberish to me. But if you're from a place and suddenly you hear them talking about it, it's like, oh, I, that's, my, that's my language. So here's these guys from Galilee that are not, they don't, speak lang they don't speak all the languages, but the power of the Holy Spirit comes in and helps them. And they declare the greatness of God. And I just mentioned that when Moses comes down and brings the law, how many people died? 3,000. Now on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes to help us, 3,000 people got saved. So the early church goes from 120 to now three, 
over 3,000 in one day. This is like the first Billy Graham crusade, right? It's like, boom, here it is. Here's the gospel. And you, and you want to know who, gave the, who, who was explaining what was going on in all this? Peter. I, de I denied the Lord three times, Peter. This is the, this is the new guy. He's, he's the, he recognized that the Lord was his strength. And now he's got the Holy Spirit to help him and to, and to bring him into the power and to declare the good news. You remember what the good news is? Jesus came. Jesus came and paid for my sins, and now he's alive. Now, we're, now we can have our sins paid for. And we've, what we've got at this, as Acts is beginning, and it's important that we understand this because we're going to have a little momentum boost, uh, a little momentum stopper in just a minute when we get to the story of Ananias and Sapphira. I want you to understand the church was booming. Peter and John, on their way to the synagogue, they grab a crippled man, and boom, he's walking. He's, he's, he's jumping for joy. He's, he's praising the Lord. And the, this early church, is they're united. They're not bickering amongst themselves like the apostles did before when they were, when they were like, arguing. When Jesus said he had to go, they're like, well, I'm going to be the greatest. I'm the one that's going to take over, right? They're arguing about who's the greatest. Now they're saying, Lord's the greatest, and we're here to tell you about them. And they're putting their own agenda aside so that in, they're in common good. And let me go ahead and read to you now. We'll get to, this is the, we're going to back up. We're going to a little bit before the story of Ananias and Sapphira. So we're going to, um, this is in Acts um, chapter 4, verse 32. This is kind of the summary of what I was talking about of, of the church being united together. Um, 30, verse 32. And the, and the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was, none, uh, there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of lands or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet and they would be distributed to each as he had need. Now Joseph, a Levite of, of Cyprian birth, who was also called Bar Barnabas by the apostles, which, what a great name, translates son of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is an example of good. Now we have an example of bad. But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself, and with his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Yeah. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard of it. I bet. The young men got up and covered him, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there lapsed an interval of about three hours, and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, Yep, that's the price. Then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead. And they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the whole church and all who heard these things. Anybody else think this may be an example of overkill? I mean... Um, it certainly did for me. I mean, even now when I read, I'm like, oh, that just seems like a heavy, a heavy, a heavy, uh, maybe, maybe the, the, the punishment doesn't fit the crime. But before we get to that, let me just kind of go back. Did you catch what the sin was? Was the sin that, that, he, that they, they, uh, they were stingy? Not really, right? I mean, the, the point is, the sin is that they said they were giving the whole, all of the proceeds from the selling of the field, to the apostles, but was that what happened? No, no. They, and then you, the question is, why would you do that? What's the motivation there? Pride. Pride. They wanted to. They wanted to look good for God, or look good for man. Man, yeah. They were. They wanted to like. 
be, say, oh, look at them, oh, look at them, they're so, they're so generous, but they were fakers. Remember we, uh, so we, were, we asked you to think about something fake? Because give me some examples of some of the things you thought about. Anybody? Anything fake, phony, pretenders? Fireproof matches. Fireproof matches. You know, I... Uh, Yeah, it kind of yeah, and that's that's kind of what these guys were doing. This couple, and I want you to notice, did they get treated exactly as a couple? I mean, when Peter when Peter confronted them, he did it individually, right? They they weren't they were they were accountable individually, not as a couple, and uh, I think that's important. No, because we're not responsible for other people's sins. Who's, whose sins are we responsible for? Our own. And I wish it wasn't true, but when I think about fakers and imitators. Sadly, I think about, sometimes I think about people who claim to be Christians, the televangelists and others that, now they're not all bad. I've just seen a lot of fake ones. You guys remember Jim and Tammy Baker? T Baker the fakers? You know, they, the, it doesn't represent the Lord well, right? And, and here we have, I, I tell you what, do you think this sobered up you think, you think that this got the pretenders out of the way? Yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're thinking like, oh, okay, if I join this club, you know, I'm going to, and, I, and, I, and, I'm, and I, I'm not completely honest, I mean, they could take me out. You know, I think that what it did is it purified the hearts of those that were, that were walking with the Lord. They went, w only the serious need apply because these guys, you know, this is, this is a game changer. Now, why did they get taken out? And then you've got somebody like David, right? Did David sin? Uh, kind of biggies, right? He uh, committed adultery, and then he committed murder, and not just one person, right? He sent he sent the he sent um, the husband up to the front lines and then pulled back. But he that wasn't the only casualty. The, there were men around him that died too. So, and David was trying to cover up his sin. And one sin led to another sin. Now, I think it's important. Did he have consequences for his sin? Absolutely. You read about the life of David, and he had some family problems. Uh, and, and some of the things that he did in private were done to him in public. But what, did, what, is it, what does the Bible say about David's heart? He had a heart, he had a heart after God. And I think that when you ask the question, why did Ananias and Sapphira, why did, they why did they get taken out? I think that, one, it's because God takes his church very seriously. He wants us to represent him. Now, are we sinners? Do we miss the mark? Absolutely. And the Bible is full of, you know, people that are seeking to be after God that are, that are flawed. But the point is, do you have a, do you have a heart to follow the Lord and to follow Jesus and to be led by the Holy Spirit, or are you on your own agenda? These two were on their own agenda. They were, they were fakers. They weren't the real deal. And when you look at, at David, David had a heart after, after God. So he, he repented, right? He said, I have sinned, and now, Lord, please forgive me. And he did forgive him. Now, he doesn't always remove the consequences. Remember I mentioned, remember Peter? Peter denied the Lord three times. Were there any consequences for him? Yeah, the secular historians tell us that wherever he went, people would cock-a-doodle-doo at him, right? Just remind him of his, of his falling short and, and not making it to the, you know, that he, that he denied the Lord. Now, if I was him, I would say, you want to go walk on water with me right now, right? Because what, what did Peter do? He walked on water. Now, when, did he, when, did he, when was he successful at doing that? He had his eyes on Jesus. And I think that's, that's the thing when, you know, this is the early church getting started and God's looking for real worshipers, those that would seek him not on Sundays or not on Saturdays, but seven days a week. And these guys as a group were, were on fire for the Lord. They were full of the Holy Spirit. They were doing miracles. In fact, let me just read you. I'm going to keep reading from where we were just at. Um, so great, I just mentioned great fear as 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 filled them. Everybody's like, uh-oh, the Lord can zot you if you're, if you're a faker. Better not go if I'm, if I'm not in it, in it to win it, right? So verse 12, at the, 
At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were with one. Uh, they were all, uh, all in one accord with in Solomon's portico, but none of the rest dared to associate with him. However, the people held him in high esteem, and all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number, to such an extent that they were even carried the sick out to the streets and laid them on cots and pallets so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. And also the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who, who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. So it's interesting because on the one side, you've got people being like, oh, I don't know if I want to join, but that's the half-hearted. What do you see as the theme here? Is the church, is the church growing or, or shrinking? It's growing. It's continuing to grow because these guys are being led by the Holy Spirit. These are the true worshipers that are re representing, and that's, that's who we want to model ourselves after. We, wanna, we don't want to be the Ananias and Sapphira. We want to be the Peter and the... Um, we want to be the, you know, the Peter and the Paul. We're going to, if you keep reading in Acts, you'll, you'll be introduced to the character Saul, who with an encounter in Jesus, he goes from being a persecutor and a killer of Christians to what? He's joining the club. He's joining the club. He's going to, give, he's going to lay down his life, and he's going to suffer, but he's going to do it because he believes in Jesus, and he's letting Jesus be Lord and Savior. I want to, we're going to shift gears and, and uh, we're going to look at, at the book of John. Now, John was written by, the Gospel of John was written by the Apostle John, one of those inner circle. Remember he mentioned the, the little group that goes up to the Mount of Transfiguration? John was in that, was in that group, and he tells his Gospel is about uh, Jesus as well, about the life and the ministry. And it's interesting because what we're going to look at now is a, series, is a, a spot. Jesus has just fed 5,000 men plus women and children. And the Jews are coming to him and they are asking for a sign. What, that wasn't enough? When was the last time you fed 5,000 people? And, and Jesus has an interesting thing because he's, he's he, uh, you know, in, in God's wisdom, Jesus has this all planned out, right? He knows where they're going, but they're focused on earthly things. They're, they're on fleshly and, and material things. And watch what happens because what he's going to talk about is going to be a purifying thing for, for the people that claim to be followers of Jesus. There it's going to be a test. All right, so this is John uh, chapter 5, and let's start at verse 32. Remember, Jesus is just, they're, they're, they're asking for another sign. He just fed them, and now they're, now, and, and of course, Jesus walks on water on the way over, no big deal. And then now he's, now, he's, uh, now, he's, now he's answering to them because they're like, well, what sign are you going to do? You know, Moses, Moses had man in the, in the wilderness. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down of heaven and gives life to the world. And they, then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus said to him, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. I'm going to pause there for just a second. We're going to take communion in a few minutes, so I'm going to have you just, we're going to go ahead and pass out the communion. So go ahead and grab the cup and the bread, um, and, but we'll, we'll uh, let me finish up here. Um, and so they're saying, Lord, give us this bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will, ne will not go hungry, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said this to you, uh, but I said this to you, you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that all, of, all that he has given me I will lose nothing, but raise up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. And therefore the Jews grumb were grumbling about him because he, said, because he said, I am the bread that comes out of heaven. They were saying, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he, say, how does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? Now, was Joseph 
his legal dad? Jesus', Jesus legal dad? Jesus was, yeah. So, so Joseph was Jesus' legal, legal dad. And that's what they're, they're kind of, they're like, wait a minute, this guy has an earthly father. How is it he said he came out of heaven? But who was it? Was it Joseph that conceived with Mary? No, it was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, so did Jesus come out of heaven? Yeah. Yeah, he legally had an earthly dad, Joseph, who was legally responsible, but that's, he wasn't the dad, he wasn't the, he wasn't the, the, um, the legal he wasn't, he wasn't the blood relative, let's say, of Jesus. He wasn't the, the blood dad. That would be the Holy Spirit. It would be the Father. Um, so Jesus answered and said, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and, and they shall all be taught of God, and everyone who has heard and learned about the Father comes to me. Not that anyone who has seen the Father, except the one who is from God, he has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever, and the bread... And the bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my, my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, he who eats me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread which came down of heaven. Not as the fathers ate and died, he who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said to the people in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. I'll we'll read on just a minute, but let's stop right there because does it, it sounds a little morbid, right? You're talking about eating my flesh and, and, and drinking my blood. But we're going to read on and see, is Jesus talking about the fleshly things? I mean, he's kind of talking that way, but he's talking about spiritually. He's, gonna, he's talking about spiritually, but are they hearing him? I think, they're, I think their ears are a little stuffed full of cotton. I don't think they're hearing this message very clearly. Um, and it, as we are kind of getting to it, this is kind of becomes a matter of the heart. Are you, are you in it for a, for a meal? Or are you in it for eternal time with God the Father in heaven? So let, let's keep on reading here. Therefore, many of the disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious of his, that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, Does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Which is what we just talked about at the beginning of Acts, right? There were witnesses that his, uh, the disciples watched him ascend into heaven. He's kind of talking about what's going to happen while he's still on earth. Uh, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he was saying, For this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. Now, here's the consequence. As a result of many of the uh, many of, uh, as a result of, of this, many of the disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Ooh. So Jesus said to the twelve, You do not want to go away also, do you? Ah, back to Peter again. Let's listen to Peter. I love Peter's response. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is another time of kind of purification, right? It's a test of, are you, are you really a worshiper of God, or, or are you just here for a free meal? And I think that, you know, there are people that come to church, and they want a little religious experience, but they don't really want all of Jesus. 
They don't really want him to be Lord and Savior, right? They, wanna, they like want to come and experience him for an hour or two on Sunday mornings, and they want to go and do their thing and be their own Lord. And I think that's, that's something that, that's not what Jesus is looking for. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit so that we could, we could be just like this early church, all united with one common go- goal, to spread the gospel, to share the good news, because we all, if you're walking with Jesus, you've got the good news. You've got salvation. You've got eternal life, and you've got, but he doesn't want to just like be the ticket to get you into heaven. He wants you to walk with him now so that you can do what he has for you to do on earth. Jesus was about doing whose will? The Father's will. To let the, to, he wanted to be doing what the Father, what's the will? What's the Father's will? The Bible tells us the will of the Father is that none should perish. But God built us with a heart that has to decide what we do with him. He doesn't make us choose him unconditionally. He could do that. Anybody ever thought, like, I thought this, right? Like, Lord, could you just make me only want you and not be tempted with anything else? I would, I would like that, right? I don't want to not follow you. I don't want to be steered away. But he gives us any meaningful relationship has to have a choice. If I say you're going to be my friend, it's not really a choice. It's not really a friendship. There's no... This, and that's where God in his, his great design allows us freedom to choose to say, where's your heart? Is your heart for me? If so, I expect you to follow me all the days of your life. I want, you to be, I want to be your Lord and I want to be your Savior. I want you to let the Holy Ghost come into your life and start changing you. Because if he's not changing you, that's a check that there's probably, you're, you're probably not walking with the Lord. Now, there, are we going to be without sin? Nope. Nope. Now, we should be making progress, though, in cleaning up our life because Ananias and Sapphira were a bad example about being a Christian. They were, they were fakers. They weren't the real deal. Now, we just read about Jesus. Is Jesus the real deal? Jesus is the real deal. He gave his body. He gave his blood. And he's looking for true worshipers that will follow him and spread the gospel. Hey, don't keep it to yourself. Let's spread this good news to the world. What's the good news? Jesus died for your sins. Put your, put your faith in him. Jesus just said that. This is, Jesus isn't making this stuff up. He's saying what the Father said from the beginning. He said, we need a Savior. We need somebody that's going to come and be the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice. When he got baptized by John, John saw him and he said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That Old Testament system that we needed sacrifices to, when they take the animals, they kill all the animals. God wasn't against animals. He was trying to teach us, teach them, that there was a consequence for sin, that sin created death. He separates us from God. We needed, we needed the Lamb of God. That per, the, Jesus came, he lived a perfect life. Why? To pay for our sins so that we could spend forever with him. But we want to be like John and Peter and these, these, these uh, Barnabas, you know, guys that would give of their life and put the mission first. Because that's effective gospel. When people, you can say you're a Christian, but if you walk out here and you rip somebody off, are they going to think you're walking the walk? I mean, non-Christians are probably better than anybody at knowing whether you're a Christian or not, whether you're, whether you're, whether you're genuine or whether you're a faker. Now we're going to, you've got your, your bread in your, in your cup. Now, Jesus started this the night before he went to the cross. Now, this is, not, this is not his literal body, and this is not his literal blood. He said to do this in remembrance of what he was going to do. This, this, this bread is unleavened bread. In the Bible, yeast represents sin. And Jesus is the only one that ever lived that was without sin, and he did it with a purpose. He came to be that perfect sacrifice his body, the one he was just talking about, spiritually, we need to consume him because we need to unite with him on a deeper level. We're not just coming to him for a, for a little snack on Sunday morning. We're coming to him to be our Lord and our Savior in our life. And this is a reminder of what he, that his body was broken for that. So I want you to take it. Just break it. It's small, but just break it. His body was broken, and, and he was pummeled. His body was, was beaten beyond recognition. And he did that because he loved us so much. Well, let's take his body and, and, and remember what he, what he did on the cross.
Now, as Pastor Izzy said, the Lord was smart. And when he, when he instituted communion, he did, the, he did the, the bread first and the juice second so that you can start to talk again afterwards. But Jesus also said that his blood was shed. And we're consuming his blood. Now, this isn't, again, his literal blood. It's a symbol of the blood that he shed, that perfect sacrifice that paid for your sin and paid for my sin. Uh, let's partake. So, as you go through your week, I pray that you remember that this time of communion and you remember what Jesus did, because I think it's easy to get, you know, the second we walk out here and get into our cars, we start going about our regular routine, and, and it's pretty easy to get our eyes off the Lord. But remember what Jesus did for us. And we have to make a decision in our heart about who we're going to follow, and whether we're going to follow him half-heartedly or whether we're going to do like the young church. You know, we just read about the, the young church was, was doing awesome miracles, People were getting healed, spiritual healings and physical healings because of their faith. They were united in faith and they were full of the Holy Spirit. And I think in this, in this culture, sadly, I think we get a little bit, it's easy to sort of go, oh yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've got the Lord. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to heaven. I'm pretty sure. I think I am. You know, it's like, hey, we want to hold on to that and we want to claim God's given us power. Why did he give us the Holy Spirit? So we need a helper. He's, it's there to help us. All we have to do is say, Lord, I'm going to follow you. Use me. And if you have that attitude in your heart, you'd be amazed at the opportunities. You'll have, the Lord will open up your eyes and you'll see, oh, this person needs help. Or, this person needs encouragement. Or this person needs to know about Jesus. You know what? I, I, I'm usually pretty nervous about this and maybe I still am, but I'm going to choose to step out of my comfort zone and I'm going to share the good news of, of Christ. We were just, Pastor Izzy was teaching last week about in the book of John, right? John is like, there's a world that's perishing. Let's reach out to them. Let's help them. Um, so let's be that. Let's not, let's, you know, Ananias and Sapphira are examples that we don't want to follow. So let's, let's, let's do what the early church did. Let's gather in prayer. Let's go to each other's homes. Let's, let's read God's word and let's be full of the Holy Spirit and, we, and watch what happens. We want to see what happened in this church happen in the early church. We want to go from 120 to to 3,000 in one day. And we can't do that on our own, but we can if we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. All right, let's, just, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this chance to look at your word. And Lord, you, you give us good examples of things to follow, and you also give us examples in your word of things not to follow. And so, Lord, purify our own hearts this morning. Lord, help us get our eyes on you and be full of the Holy Spirit and choose to make you Lord and Savior. Lord, let us... May you lead us and guide us each day of this week. And Lord, may we start to see opportunities to reach out to a dying world and to share the gospel. We thank you for being here. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and for that breeze, Lord. And we just pray that you would refresh us this coming week. We pray for those that are sick and not here right now. Lord, give them strength. And then we also pray for Pastor Izzy and his family. Lord, on their vacation, Lord, bless it and make it, make it special. We ask that now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.